So when you think of an Intel Nook, you're probably thinking of a small, lightweight computer that is perfect for basic desktop tasks and maybe some other light workloads here and there. But what if I told you the integrated graphics of some of these higher end mini PCs are getting good enough to start to compete within the gaming space. In this video, I'm going to show you that an Intel Nook has the power to be a gaming PC. Geekom sent this device over for review. They're a Intel Nook distributor and they have an online store with uh, some of their own branded mini PCs if you are interested. Now, the device I have here is the Intel Nook 13 Pro. There are a few different configuration options. The one I have here is the i7-1360P with 32 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM and a one terabyte SSD. The processor is 12 cores, 16 threads with an advertised turbo boost up to 4.6 gigahertz and a power consumption range of 28 to 64 watts. Also featuring an Intel Wi-Fi card supporting 6E and Bluetooth 5.0. Three. Now, to the unboxing experience, it is very similar to any other Intel Nook out there. We have our actual computer, our power supply, which is uh, rather beefy for this device. A uh, vase amount to hide it behind your monitor if need be. And then you have your manual and warranty documentation. As far as the IO is concerned, the front of this device has two USB 3.2 Gen 2s, as well as a 3.5 stereo jack and our power button. The sides of this device are open vents, making the cooling situation fairly decent. And then looking on the back is where it gets a little more impressive. We have not one, but two Thunderbolt 4 ports, two HDMI ports, another USB 3.2 and a standard USB 2.0. My favorite thing on the back here is the 2.5 gigabit ethernet port, something I think should be standard on modern computers at this point. The combination of that 2.5 gigabit ethernet and the Intel hardware acceleration makes this a fantastic option to host a Plex or Jellyfin server. As a matter of fact, I think these little mini PCs make phenomenal compact home servers. And I'll actually be uploading a video in a few days showing how to turn this mini TI-11 into a little home server. Opening up and upgrading the device is pretty standard for these nooks. The little feet pad have screws, you just kind of unscrew those, they loosen, you could pop the whole thing off and have access to the SD card as well as the system memory. In addition to the pre-installed NVMe SSD, we have a BT SATA port available. And since this is the tall model, we have room to put a small 2.5 inch SSD or hard disk drive. Again, really nice if you get a high capacity one, throw it, your entire media library on it and use this as a media or backup server. This hardware is actually fairly close to some of the high-end desktop CPUs, so just the overall experience in the system is very fluid. It does ship with Windows, but after I got all my initial footage, I did throw Arch Linux on it, and the experience there was equally as pleasant. I did run Geekbench on both Windows and Linux, and the results were fairly close, but Windows overall did benchmark a little bit better with roughly 400 point increase on the single core scores and over a thousand point increase on the multi-core scores. I'll leave the Geekbench results linked down below if you want to see some more of the uh, detailed specifics within the tests. Running professional applications such as DaVinci Resolved served me no issues and ran incredibly smoothly, primarily thanks to the surprisingly decent integrated graphics within this Intel CPU. I decided to run a render test and keep a temperature monitor open to see how high and how quickly the cooling was working. And while rendering in DaVinci Resolve, the temperature hit a max of 71 degrees Celsius and rapidly dropped down back into the mid fifties. As soon as the render was over, since I had the application open, I ran Nova Bench and during this benchmark, the CPU reached 3.7 gigahertz. The direct X test game scored 20 frames per second and the memory peak speed was almost 13,000 megabits per second. The read write speed of the Kingston SSD that it shipped with gave me about 2,500 megabytes a second. And the total score for this test was 2407. But this was after running that video render in a few days ago when I did a fresh install, it did score slightly higher. After all this, I was still in a benchmarking mood. So I opened up Basemark Web 3.0 in Microsoft Edge 
and after running this test I scored a 1085, higher than some of the other times I've ran this test on my desktop computer with a Ryzen 3700X. Now I was going to use this Intel Nook as my main Linux machine, but unfortunately DaVinci Resolve is not yet compatible on these integrated Intel graphic chips as of yet on Linux. Geekom is sending over a comparable AMD machine, which I'll be doing a full comparison video in the coming weeks versus this Intel machine we have here. It's going to be an Intel versus AMD showdown, and I'm really looking forward to that video. So do make sure you subscribe, ring that bell. I did do a lot of tests on this machine, and one thing it does really well is recording in OBS at 1440p. So what I think I'm gonna do is use this Intel Nook as my dedicated little recording box, and then set up the AMD machine as my actual workstation with either Fedora or Arch Linux running on it. Again, we'll have to see. So now on to what you actually came here for, and that is the gaming experience. For the first few games, I recorded in both 1080p and 1440p, just so you can see some of the performance differences. First, Splitgate at 1080p ran a silky smooth, hovering in the 70 frame per second range, occasionally hitting up to 80 frames per second. I will note, this game particularly, the CPU was rather toasty, reaching 90 degrees Celsius at its hottest point. Now, bumping the resolution up to 1440p, we saw frame rates in the 40s and 50s, still playable, but considerably lower. Now next up, we have Fall Guys. At 1080p, the CPU did cool down a little bit, but not too much. We saw basically the same frame rates hovering in the 60s and 70s, and then bumping up the resolution to 1440p, we saw frame rates floating in the upper 30s and occasionally hitting 40 frames per second. The next game I tried was Forza. For some reason, MSI Afterburner was not cooperating with this game, so I had to use some of the uh, integrated Intel monitors. I have dynamic render quality set to medium, and in this game, it wouldn't let me push it beyond 1080p. This game is a bit more graphically intensive, so we ended up hovering in the high 30s to lower 40s as far as frame rates. Do keep in mind that I didn't go into the BIOS and increase the wattages or anything like that, as it was already getting warm enough. Overall, the games I tried have been very playable, not the kind of gaming performance that you're going to get off of a modern, dedicated GPU, but really for what it is in this compact form factor and 1080p gaming, it is awesome. And playing anything that isn't too graphically demanding is going to be great. Now for giggles, the last game I tried was Microsoft Flight Simulator. This game is known for having some rather high system requirements and takes a lot of resources to run. Even when I first launched the game, it said that your PC does not meet these requirements, but I proceeded anyways. For settings, I had to select the low end preset. I picked no world streaming, so it wouldn't be trying to pull satellite imagery. Also, for some reason, this game wouldn't let me pick the uh, actual resolution, and it was forcing me to use it in window mode. So I resized it to what I believe would be close to 1080p, and this game would, I would give a playable rating as it did open and ran, but it was running in the 20s for frames per second. Basically, I would not buy this PC specifically for that game. So this Nook definitely can game depending on the games you're actually trying to play and depending on kind of your standard of frame rates. You can't expect modern titles to be able to play 1080p around 60 frames per second if it's not like crazy graphically intensive and maybe around 40 frames per second for some of those AAA titles. These Intel Nook devices are not necessarily cheap as well. The configuration I have demonstrated today comes in about $1,000 with the sale that they're running, and you could technically save money by using or buying the bare bones system, adding your own RAM and SSD for about $800 with the sale, but you could save even more money by dropping down from the i7 to the i5. This one here is definitely much cheaper than some of the uh, Intel Extreme Editions, which come in with a price point around $2,000, which someday, hopefully I actually can check out on this channel. The AMD machine I will be comparing this to in a few weeks comes in at a few hundred dollars cheaper with a Ryzen 6900HX, so that is definitely going to be a fun comparison. I'm interested, what do you all think about the performance of these current gen Intel Nooks? And could you ever see yourself switching your desktop PC to a small form factor PC like this? 
Uh, again, big thank you to Geekon for sending these over and partnering with us for a couple of videos so we can check out a couple of the options in this category of computing. Make sure you check out our newsletter for some Linux and tech goodness. And with all that, I do hope you have an absolutely beautiful day and good.